Hello and welcome back to my channel, Civil War Reports. I am your War of the Rebellion reporter, Brian Thomas Kopak, and today is part two of my look at the war of words that took place between General James Longstreet and General Jubal Early. So, one of the things that General Longstreet has been accused of here at Gettysburg, thus causing the Confederate defeat, is that he delayed, that he wasted too much time on July 2nd. Jubal Early will assert that General Longstreet had orders to attack first thing on July 2nd, but in his memoirs, General Longstreet um, will counter this argument by providing letters from people who were still alive after the war on General Lee's staff who basically attested that no such orders ever existed. On July 2nd, Longstreet did not have his entire corps present here at Gettysburg. General Pickett's division was all the way back at Chambersburg and would not arrive here at Gettysburg until the afternoon of July 2nd, shortly before Longstreet would launch his attack. But Longstreet wanted to wait at least until Evander Law's Alabama Brigade arrived here. They were part of General Hood's division. Longstreet at least wanted two full-strength divisions when he launched the attack here on July 2nd. And in Longstreet's own words, when he launched the attack, he did it basically with only his corps. Yes, he did have A.P. Hill's division under the command of General Anderson to his immediate left. But in Longstreet's defense, most of the fighting on July 2nd was done entirely by his corps attacking the Union left. General Ewell, for the most part, only did artillery demonstrations and did not launch an attack on the Union right until Longstreet's attack here on the left had fizzled out. In regard to Longstreet's attack on the Union left flank, we know that his corps did some amazing fighting that day. They made great progress, but they did not achieve a breakthrough. Yes, they did capture the Peach Orchard and Devil's Den, but they were unable to capture the real prize, Little Round Top. As a result, he was blamed for defying orders, being too slow, for dragging his feet when an attack should have been made, and that this delay allowed the Union Army to come up in force and fortify their positions. Longstreet countered these arguments by stating the following. So what was Longstreet's response to the claims that he delayed too long and that cost the Confederates a victory here at Gettysburg? Well, as mentioned, Jubal Early did assert that Longstreet had orders to attack first thing on July 2nd, and I've already stated that um, members of Lee's staff after the war would say no, no such orders existed. And we could also look at Colonel Fremantle's memoirs, who stated that at 5 a.m. on July 2nd, Lee was still trying to figure out a battle plan for this day. So Longstreet did not have orders to attack first thing on July 2nd. But in terms of waiting until 4 o'clock, here's what Longstreet had to say in rebuttal to those claims that he delayed. Well, according to Longstreet, by the morning of July 2nd, most of the Union Army was up. For the most part, this is true. Um, in addition to the 1st and 11th Corps that fought on July 1st, by the morning of July 2nd, the 12th Corps, the 3rd Corps, the 2nd Corps, and the 5th Corps were pretty much present here at Gettysburg. Only the huge 6th Corps was not here at Gettysburg on the morning of July 2nd. Also, Lee did allow Longstreet to delay so Evander Law's Alabama Brigade could arrive here at Gettysburg and thus Longstreet could go into the fight on July 2nd with two full divisions of infantry. 
And this last one, and this is why I'm filming in front of the peach orchard, um, is a bit of a stretch, but Longstreet made this claim that yes, he delayed, but he did not delay long enough. According to Longstreet, he launched his attack here at 4 o'clock, but shortly before 4 o'clock, General Meade had discovered that General Sickles had advanced his corps out to the Emmitsburg Road here at the Peach Orchard, bending it back towards Devil's Den. And Meade wanted Sickles to return to his original line back by Little Round Top. Longstreet asserts that had he waited about another half hour and then he attacked, he would have attacked when the Third Corps was redeploying back to its original position, thus catching the Third Corps off guard, and thus probably could have won the day for the Confederates if he only delayed for about another half an hour. Bit of a stretch, but kind of makes sense. Now, yes, Jubal Early was very critical of General James Longstreet, but Longstreet, particularly in the post-war years, his post-war writings, uh, was also very, very critical of General Jubal Early. For instance, here at Gettysburg, Longstreet would assert that when Jubal Early attacked, he only attacked with some of his brigades, not his entire division. And there is truth behind that. And Longstreet would also be very, very critical of Jubal Early when he would rise to the command of the Second Corps and his 1864 campaign that brought the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia into Maryland. But here at Gettysburg, in many ways, this is comparing apples and oranges. Longstreet was a Corps commander here at Gettysburg, and he made decisions on how to handle his divisions and when and where they should attack. Here at Gettysburg, Early was still a division commander, and he basically was acting under the orders of his corps commander, General Richard Yule. So in a lot of ways, Longstreet's criticism of Early here at Gettysburg is an apples to oranges comparison when he's trying to compare himself, a corps commander, to Early, a division commander. And as I said, he would also be very critical of Jubal Early when he was in command of the Second Corps in 1864, which was brought into Maryland in an effort to try to take pressure off the siege of Petersburg. And Early was met with defeat as he was heading back into Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley. And again, that's in many ways an apples and oranges comparison because the Confederate Second Corps in 1864, in the fall of 1864, was vastly different than it was here at Gettysburg in the summer of 1863. But needless to say, these two men kept bickering back and forth about each other and their actions, and a lot of it had to do with what happened here at Gettysburg. Now, there are some who believe that the bad rap that General Longstreet has received has nothing to do with anything he did on any battlefield anywhere. But the bad rap that he gets comes from everything he did after the war. So let's take a look at what General Longstreet did after the fighting ended in 1865. Well, first off, he becomes a Republican. And that is absolutely taboo in post-war South. The Republican Party is the party of Lincoln. It's the party of abolition. It is not the party that a true Southerner would want to embrace. But Longstreet becomes a Republican, so that's number one. Number two, he encourages other Southerners to become Republicans. Um, three, one point during the Reconstruction era, he is in charge of a black militia unit in New Orleans, and they fire on former white Confederate soldiers. But probably the worst thing that James Longstreet did after the Civil War, the ultimate Southern taboo was he spoke badly about Robert E. Lee, especially 
after Lee had died and he was unable to defend himself. That was probably the biggest sin General Longstreet committed after the war. In a more modern era attempt to try to justify General Longstreet's post-war decisions, author Charles C. Osborne, in his biography on Jubal Early, claimed that the reason why Longstreet became a Republican was that Longstreet feared black suffrage. He feared the black man having the right to vote and thus felt the best way to combat this from happening was to fight the system from within. That if he became a Republican, he could basically try to keep the black man from getting the right to vote. What do you think about that? I'm standing in front of Hayes Brigade Marker here at Gettysburg, which was part of Early's division here. And I just want to talk about Jubal Early towards the end of the war and what he did afterwards. So about a month before Lee surrendered at Appomattox, Jubal Early was relieved of command of the 2nd Corps, thus pretty much ending his military career. And that was something that General Longstreet would poke fun at for the rest of their lives. And once the war was over, Jubal Early fled America. He was out of the country for a couple years, but when he returns, he was a fierce proponent of the lost cause theory. So let me just tell you briefly what the lost cause theory, what the lost cause was. It basically had six components. One, that the state's rights issue and non-slavery were the real reasons for the war. Two, Slaves were faithful to their benevolent masters. Three, the South only lost due to the North's overwhelming amount of men and resources. Four, the Southern soldier was heroic and brave and warriors doing God's work. Five, uh, Southern women were loyal, faithful, and honorable mothers, wives, and sisters to a noble cause. And the sixth, and probably the most important one for the lost cause, was that General Lee was a godlike figure and he was held above reproach. These are the six points that Jubal Early held near and dear to his heart to the day he died, and General Longstreet basically embraced none of this. Both these men would live a good many years after the Civil War ended, outliving most of their fellow generals. Jubal Early would pass away on March 2nd, 1894, and General Longstreet would outlive him by 10 years, passing away on January 2nd, 1904, dying just six days before his 83rd birthday. Longstreet was one of the few Civil War generals to live into the 20th century. So who won this war of words? Was there a winner? Were they both right? Were they both wrong? Well, I have my opinion, but my opinion doesn't matter as much as your opinion. Please leave a comment below. Tell me who you think won this war of words. There's really no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's just your opinion and whatever reasons you have to support that opinion. For Civil War Reports, I am your War of the Rebellion reporter, Brian Thomas Kopak. And if you'd like to read up more on this topic, the main sources I used to bring this episode to you were James Longstreet's Memoirs, From Manassas to Appomattox. James Longstreet, Lee's War Horse, by H.J. Eckenrode and Brian Conrad. Jubal, The Life and Times of General Jubal A. Early, CSA. Jubal Early's Own Memoirs, The Memoirs of General Jubal Early. And finally, Three Months in the Southern States by Lieutenant Colonel Arthur J. Fremantle. And if you like what you saw today, please hit the subscribe button. Give a thumbs up. Also, notify your friends. Let them know about this channel and ask them to subscribe as well. If you like, you may leave a question or a comment below, and perhaps I will answer your question in a future episode of Civil War Reports. Until next time, please keep the history alive.